Okay, uh, we're going to be starting, uh, Doctor. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure to have you all here on this Saturday evening in the UAE. Um, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Mohammed al Rada, who uh, is an old friend, but he is not here in this capacity. He is here because he is at the forefront of dealing with the current uh, crisis that we are going through. And he will uh, give us an hour of his time to explain what's happening and we will uh, be able to send him questions. He's prepared a wonderful presentation, which I will begin in a, in a minute or so, but a little bit about Dr. Mohammed al -Ridha. He is the director of the Project Management Office at, of Health Informatics and Smart Health at Dubai Health Authority. So if you notice, the word health is recurring here. Dr. al -Ridha was a research fellow at Harvard Medical School, and he was also a graduate and a postgraduate uh, from the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. He also holds a master's degree in healthcare management. So I think uh, it's very few people that I can imagine who would give us uh, the insight that Dr. Mohammed al-Rida can share with us. Dr. Mohammed al-Rida will be presenting for about 20 minutes, some slides that he's prepared. We will also have interventions uh, from a, a gentleman I will introduce later, Julian Kal uh, Kalanen, and from uh, Dr. Manal Teriam uh, within the next half hour. Please keep your questions coming in the chat. Try to include your affiliation so that when I ask the question to Dr. Mohammed al he knows from which background you're coming. Um, and also make sure that your question is set to public rather than to private, uh, unless, of course, you want to send me something privately that's also allowed. Uh, Doctor, uh, I will uh, begin in a, uh, in a minute. Uh, I will open your presentation and I will share my screen. Here we go. Okay. So uh, can you guys see this? Uh, I might need your help. Um, pray from start. Doctor? Great. Shukran, Basrood. Uh, thank you so much uh, for hosting me uh, today. It gives me great pleasure to uh, be on such a wonderful platform, the Cultural Majlis, and uh, to be hosted by you, Sultan. You've done great so far, mashallah alaik. Uh, I cannot tell you the importance of uh, such an initiative, not only from a knowledge transfer uh, point of view during the uh, current situation, but also on the mental health of, of, of the people and the friends around you as well. It is very, very important. So thank you, Sultan. Um, in speaking about the role of technology in the pandemic, uh, I'd like to uh, share with you a bit of an insight and maybe take you to a little bit of a history uh, of pandemics. Uh, so Sultan, allow me to, uh, yes, thank you. So uh, before going into the history, I'd like to uh, explain the, the way it works for us in the United Arab Emirates. As uh, most of you would know, uh, we have Dubai Health Authority active in the Emirate of Dubai. We have Dubai, uh, sorry, Department of Health, DOH, active in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. And we have the United Arab Emirates Ministry of Health and Prevention, MOHAP, active in the five Northern Emirates and also acting as a federal uh, conduit between the Prime Minister office and the uh, rest of the local Emirates uh, and authorities. However, in the current uh, pandemic, we have this simple structure. We are all, all working together as three uh, entities in association with NSEMA, which is the National Emergency Crisis Disaster Management Authority. We are in collaboration with them. Uh, all our announcements in terms of data, in terms of uh, regulations, are in sync with all four of us. So a little bit of history of the pandemics, and I, and I urge you to, to Google this uh, video on, uh, on YouTube if, if you have a chance. It's a two minute video to explain to you how pandemics started from uh, the earliest uh, in 152 AD. So as, as you can imagine, uh, and allow me here to delve into one of the pandemics, which is the Spanish flu, which started in 1918 and lasted for three years. And uh, as you can see here, this is a picture of one of the hospitals, uh, very, very simple uh, resources. Uh, and going, going to uh, some of the newspapers uh, announcements at the time, you'll see that uh, you notice that they have no services in churches on Sunday. Churches are closed, uh, funeral bands, uh, uh, gyms and classes uh, have been stopped. So very similar to what we are doing right now. So what changed really? Are we, are we going to stick to basics? 
or are we going to do more? Uh, and I'll show you through the rest of the slides that we have a lot of tools in our hands and hopefully, hopefully, inshallah, we will not last uh, during this pandemic, uh, living this pandemic for uh, three, three years, inshallah, we will do it in much, much faster. So again, this is a picture of uh, one of the hospitals uh, during the, the pandemic, the Spanish flu pandemic. And uh, I noticed in, uh, in review, some of the newspapers uh, announcing that VIX Vaporub, uh, how to use VIX Vaporub in treating the Spanish influenza. So this gives you a little bit of a flavor of what kind of tools they had at hand. Some lessons learned from the Spanish flu at the time, uh, not letting up on social distancing too soon. Uh, and be careful, young people, healthy adults can be victims despite their perceived uh, strong immune systems, which can act against them at the time. Uh, so don't, don't uh, courage up at these times. Social distancing, isolation, uh, adhere and comply with all government regulations. This is advisable at this time. Not to throw unproven drugs, of course. We've seen many, many drugs uh, tested uh, at times where 25 years later, you see the adverse effects of these drugs. So we don't want to be in, in that situation starting now. Uh, starting, of course, a center for disease surveillance and control early on uh, during pandemics and, and lessons learned uh, from pandemics is always something good. And this is an advice for all nations. However, if we uh, disregard of all of the advice that we learn from these pandemics, of course, more lessons are going to be learned from the current pandemic. Uh, we will eventually uh, go into denial, humble, and then eventually lockdown, which is quite harmful. Linking into uh, COVID-19 and the current situation, um, I think if we study and, and take lessons from four countries, which I consider very, very successful in uh, uh, fighting this pandemic, and uh, allow me to, to say they are out of it. They are out of it, however, given certain restrictions in place. Taiwan, Iceland, South Korea, and Germany. Taiwan, although they have uh, an amazing universal healthcare system, uh, yet their preparedness, uh, central command centers, rigorous contact tracing using data and knowledge about who got what and what time, the speed of getting these contraptions done, uh, I think uh, gave, them, gave them a good heads up start, uh, use of the national health insurance data from their claims data, coordination with uh, government agencies such as customs and immigration, tapping into their database, acting as one, help them identify not only uh, or, uh, people who uh, have had the disease, but people who can be prevented from the disease. Iceland, uh, they partnered up with uh, an amazing lab called Decode Genetics, and they designed test kits very, very early on, and their aim was to test 10% of the population. Today, Iceland has already become a laboratory for the world, uh, not only in testing, but in terms of learning about the pandemic. They have identified 528 uh, mutations to this uh, COVID-19 coronavirus. South Korea started the drive-through booths early on, and their aim was to provide free testing, very fast testing done by staff at safe distance and get the result out as fast as possible. Germany, uh, Germany is really beat time at, at, at such times, you know, where the, where the nation was going through uh, high COVID-19 positive uh, results. They projected that they need 12,000 beds and they went ahead and built 147,000 beds, 10 times more than their need. This is an anticipation of the race because of course you simulate, you use data to simulate and you never know which scenario will happen. There is a scenario more likely than another. However, given all the, the, uh, the uh, Germany numbers race in terms of COVID-19 positives, they have been able to really keep the death rate in its population very, very low. Now, if you see the flattening of the curve, uh, if you compare those four nations, Germany, Iceland, South Korea, and Taiwan, you would probably agree that the number of deaths was very, very low compared to US, Italy, and UK. Uh, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, they have acted very fast. They have flattened the curve, lowered the curve so fast, and plateaued it, and now hopefully going down. 
Now, in terms of what has been done already on the ground in Dubai and in the United Arab Emirates, this is an image of our Dubai Health Innovation Center at Dubai Health Authority, which has been instrumental in providing 3D printed uh, devices. And I would start from the face shield. Uh, you'd see it in the next image. But I just wanted to say that I noticed the date of the opening of the center. Is this actually opened in 2019? Correct. So Correct. it was very serendipitous that we've had the center open a few months ago. Very recent, correct. Yeah. And uh, I'll, I'll take you through an image of the 3D printing lab uh, where uh, you know, a lot of the testing, a lot of the exploration happens. These are machines that are available at 3D printing lab. And by the way, this was an old kitchen, uh, a, a real kitchen, a catering kitchen that was transformed in the 3D printing lab, part of a 20-year-old building. And you can see images of the face shield there on the table, which was printed in this lab. And these are two, two of our doctors, Dr. Osama and Dr. Khalid, wearing the face shield. And allow me, Sultan, here to ask uh, Mr. Julian Callan, if he's on the call, to, uh, to give us a little bit of the process behind it. Yes, uh, I would like to introduce you all to, uh, to Julian Callanan, who's the founder and managing director of uh, Cinetrex, a Dubai-based startup specializing in 3D printed medical products. Uh, doctor, the floor is yours. Hello, good evening. I hope you can all uh, hear me okay. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you uh, today. Um, and yeah, <clears throat> uh, as, as we just had a little bit of background there, um, so my company is collaborating uh, with Dubai Health Authority uh, in the Innovation Center uh, with uh, a 3D printing facility there. And the, <clears throat> the concept actually started towards the end of 2019 when we brought uh, 3D printing to the point of care and the objective at that stage was to support the surgeons with their complex cases by producing highly accurate uh, anatomical models. Uh, and we had some amazing successes uh, doing that, recently supporting uh, kidney uh, transplant, um, where the surgeon actually estimated he saved around one hour of time uh, in the surgery. Uh, however, sadly, COVID-19 has uh, in interrupted our plans, as it has many of you uh, out there both personal and business. So what we did was we refocused and retooled uh, using the incredibly flexible machinery that we have. We started to produce uh, PPE um, and some uh, working on some prototypes for swabs uh, as well. So the face shields there are a fantastic example of something that can be produced using completely locally sourced um, uh, materials, but they're highly effective. Uh, so there's a study that shows Face shields, when worn in combination with masks, um, can reduce a uh, chance of contamination from a cough or a sneeze uh, by 96%. So they're highly effective and highly simple. Um, so we've worked a number of different solutions, face shields. These are uh, max, uh, mask extenders here. And we also even developed some uh, uh, test swabs as well, which can be used. So uh, a lot of different products. Thank you so much, Julian. Thank you. Uh, Doctor, tell us a little bit about what's written here on the back of uh, on this. It says, uh, This is a face mask suspender. It goes behind the, the ears to uh, connect the face mask. As, as you can imagine, some of these face masks can be uh, quite uh, weak and quite uh, discomfortable uh, when it comes to wearing them for hours and hours on the ward. So uh, Julian has kindly uh, supported us by creating these face mask suspenders. And all thanks to uh, our next uh, image here from uh, a child, uh, Scott from Canada, 13 year old child who inspired us really by his tweet. And if I may also uh, give a word of thanks to Julian by donating 800 face mask shields to our hospitals at Dubai Health Authority. Doctor, just a quick question. Uh, you're, you're thanking this child. What did this child do and how did you find whatever he's done? He tweeted, he tweeted on, on his Twitter account that he was uh, exploring with 3D printer that uh, what can he do to, to his hospital, his local hospital in Canada. So he found that a lot of the uh, doctors and the nurses were complaining that these face masks would break and they were uncomfortable to wear. As you can imagine, they go behind the ears. So he created this uh, face mask suspender, which goes behind the ear and mm -hmm. gives you a little bit of comfort. Now you can suddenly adjust this face mask. They're mm -hmm. usually made as a one size fits all 
uh, and and this this little year old, uh, thirteen year old fella, he created this uh, face mask suspender, which I cre- which I think is an amazing, very eloquent piece of innovation. Yeah, this is it, I think, right? Correct. Okay. This is the uh, nasal swab that Julian was referring to earlier. This is the bit that goes into deep into the nostrils to um, catch a little bit of the of the virus, and this is what goes into our analyzers, uh, PCR analyzers, to analyze the the genome of the uh, the virus. Hence, the patient would be uh, given the result whether they're positive or negative. So this is also under under testing. This is an image an image of uh, professors from the Higher College of Technology and uh, the University Hospital in Sharjah. They are experimenting with. Uh, of course, they heard about the shortage of ventilators that we have around the world. So they thought, okay, why not to create a 3D ventilator, uh, 3D printed ventilator splitter, where one device can go up to uh, supporting six patients. So this is this is where, and, and you can see it in the next image that you can create this contraption that will support two patients. However, we are always in Dubai Health Authority guided by our subject matter experts. In this case, the ICU doctors who use these ventilators. Uh, we send them these uh, tests uh, or proof of concepts and they will test it on the patient or they will test it even before going on a patient, a real life patient and tell us whether we are uh, on the right track or not. This is another device, also 3D printed, uh, a 3D ventilator splitter. Victor, can I ask you a question? Uh, I always hear about 3D printing and I'm sometimes skeptical. Does this really work or is, does it look pretty and you put it on a desk and then we never use it? Well, um, it, I mean, 3D printing never let us down so far. However, in these two instances, specifically the, uh, the nasal swabs and the uh, 3D uh, ventilator splitter, we are very, very careful because now you're suddenly dealing with um, uh, some sort of special mediums. You are dealing with microorganisms. And the last thing you want to do is to increase the rate of microorganisms. However, as a device themselves, they are, a lot of them have been passed. A lot of them have been, have been made from material that is approved, CE marked or FDA approved. And it is, it is just exactly as if you're manufacturing it but through 3D printing. So you're not, you're not changing the process. You are only changing the way it is manufactured. So, so far we've had an amazing, amazing experience with 3D printing. Okay. Uh, this is an image of our uh, screening station. Uh, it's a tent, uh, currently located at Al at Nasser Football Club. Uh, it's one of four locations. These are drive-through locations. They're very easy to use. You book an appointment and you go in, you get the test, uh, the test done uh, within a few, few minutes. Uh, results are usually uploaded within six hours, up to 48 hours, depending on the backlog. Great test, the red line comes up again. This, this, this is one of four, four tents that we have in, in, the, in Dubai, and one of 13 that we have in the United Arab Emirates. Again, complementing the, uh, the testing, we deliver medication. To our patients, we currently have upscaled our uh, our cap- capability from six cars in January to 30 cars delivering medication. These are not your regular uh, delivery services. These are uh, vehicles uh, properly prepared to handle medication. As you can imagine, medication should be handled at a certain temperature. And we also have a pharmacist on board inside the car explaining the use of medication for the patient. So this is just not just a delivery service, it's a specialized delivery service, and we've been able to get 30 vehicles immediately. Victor, these vehicles are roaming Dubai um, as we speak. Are they, retrofitted? are they retrofitted or have they been ordered this way? No, they're retrofitted. They are regular cars. They are retrofitted here in the UAE. This is an image of a 3,000 bed field hospital, which was just opened about a couple of hours ago by, by His Highness, the Crown Prince of Dubai, Sheikh Hamdan bin Hamad Brashta Al Maktoum. Uh, the capacity can go up to 10,000 beds if required. Um, yeah, okay. Um, I, I am supposed to have a guest who comes in here, but actually this is a, this is a great example to say, uh, I did have a guest coming in now, but she's a real life doctor. And so she, I think, has uh, prioritized her patients over us, which is a wonderful thing. And as soon as she's done with her patients, she's going to be joining us. 
So Dr. Manal was meant to be here on, on the call as well. And if we go back to that uh, image of, of Dubai airport, this is in the arrivals hall, Sultan. Uh, this is where uh, it's part of the meet and greet service right now. It's part of the, the new normal where uh, uh, passengers would arrive and get tested and then get quarantined for two weeks. Uh, during these two weeks, we get the results. Okay. I can imagine now uh, with the reopening of the airport to certain select uh, destinations, we would also be having the same setup in the departure hall. One of my favorite uh, contraptions here is the super intelligent helmet, which has been recently approved by His Highness Sheikh Saif bin Zayed Al Nahyan, the uh, Minister of Interior. And uh, these, are, these are amazing uh, devices. They have thermal cameras, uh, they can uh, do vital readings, analyze data immediately, uh, create and read the QR codes, uh, facial recognition, vehicle license recognition, night vision. You might wonder why the QR codes. Uh, China is right now implementing QR codes for patients who have been uh, tested positive and then became negative, so they are fine to roam around um, and be able to recognize them immediately from such a device is an amazing piece. It's, it's just very fast. Okay. Uh, doctor, uh, would you like me to pose questions now or when we're done? Um, I think we're, we're almost done. We have a few slides and then we'll take questions. for sure. Perfect. Please keep your questions coming. Uh, so this is an image of uh, His Excellency Sheikh Abdullah Al Hamid, the Chairman of the Department of Health in Abu Dhabi. Again, acted very, very quickly. Uh, he has now very fast actually implemented and started uh, the largest uh, lab outside outside of China to diagnose uh, COVID-19 uh, coronavirus, and uh, this is going to be an amazing. Uh, tool that will help us not only achieve 10%, which we are very close at right now, we will hopefully go past that 10% as well. Uh, again, another piece of uh, um, scientific uh, finding where we were able to, in the UAE, find the, the full genome sequencing of the COVID-19 virus. Of course, as, as I mentioned earlier, Iceland has discovered 528 mutations. So from the time of its first spread until it reached Iceland, you can imagine these 528 mutations that have been captured. So how many more mutations have been done? So we have captured one of them here in the UAE. This is, of course, very important for us to know what we are up against, to know what we are dealing with. Um, track and trace or tracing uh, positive cases, uh, uh, which, is, uh, which is an amazing piece of technology using an app, using the very, very basic technology, Bluetooth as well. You will be able to uh, benefit the community from getting close to positive or actively positive uh, patients with COVID-19. It will alert you, it will tell you, be careful, uh, keep social distancing, and uh, do not go very close to uh, the, the patient in front of you. Doctor, I'll have so many questions to you about the use of technology and tracking when we're done with, uh, with your presentation. Um, all of this has made us, uh, alhamdulillah, and to the world top 10 countries in the world where we have tested more than or very close to 10% of our population. 767,000 people have been tested as of yesterday. Uh, so all of these efforts are, are uh, making us uh, in the top countries that are fighting the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, and as I explained earlier, uh, this is part of the success. It's one of the recipes for success, inshallah, uh, for us not to uh, last this, this pandemic, fighting this pandemic for three years, but hopefully much, much shorter than that. Okay. Uh, allow me here also to, to mention an amazing piece of innovation uh, created by Dubai municipality when uh, we started the national sterilization program. This is an amazing piece where uh, Dubai municipality wanted a, a lot of cars to, and as, a, as you have seen already, it's a 24-hour sterilization program. So we need a lot of cars to sterilize the roads, sterilize the city. So this is where they modified their existing trucks into, uh, I'll show you in the next slide, uh, into an amazing piece of technology, sterilization, uh, ongoing 24 hours. And if I may also mention that this was done very fast and at a very, very low cost. Doctor, this is important because this is a, a innovation that took place in Dubai on the ground, no imported technologies. You basically had a limited time and you needed to 
convert existing vehicles? Um, who came up with this idea? And honestly, who had the, the trust to, 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 to give this person to, rather than importing and buying new vehicles? Can you tell us because, uh, how this works? All I can tell you is that such times, every little bit of an idea helps. Every little bit of an idea helps. And these ideas usually come from frontliners, people who are out in the field, they know what they're up against, they understand that the city's requirement, and immediately they are supported by the leadership. And here's, here's the catch, they are supported by the leadership to do it and to go ahead and test it immediately and go ahead and put it on full blast. So they, they think big, they start small, and they run fast. So some of the lessons learned from the current pandemic is, is be prepared, always be prepared. And I'm not talking about the current pandemic only, I'm, I'm talking about um, you know, future pandemics and hopefully they would be less lethal than this one. Uh, be quick, act fast, think big and run quickly is, 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 is a super imperative. Uh, test, trace, quarantine and repeat as much as possible. Use data and technology wherever possible. Be aggressive. Again, this is, this is no room for being nice. You have to be aggressive. Yes, we fight a lot. Uh, we, uh, we disagree a lot. But however, our outcomes are going to be judgmental. And uh, this is about saving lives. Getting the private sector involved early on, and we've seen an amazing collaboration from the private sector this time, specifically here in Dubai. Uh, we've been uh, acting preventatively with them. Uh, we've been uh, using a lot of technology respecting privacy alhamdulillah us in the united arab emirates we have many laws to allow us to respect privacy first drive through testing is, is something imperative uh, during pandemics and alhamdulillah we've seen many good results learning from the past from as you've seen and this was only a, a, one example spanish flu is one example we have so many other examples that we can learn from in the past test more increase your capacity in terms of testing build capacity build capacity at in terms of field hospitals acute hospitals, ICU hospitals, and isolation rooms. Um, Doctor, uh, I believe, yes, we have the slide. So this is a slide from His Highness the Conference of uh, Dubai, Sheikh Hamdan Mohammed Rashid Al Maktoum. Uh, him yesterday at 7 p.m. monitoring progress with the Supreme Committee, uh, the Supreme Disaster Committee at the level of government of Dubai, led by His Highness Sheikh Mansour Mohammed Rashid Al Maktoum. All director generals, key director generals are part of this committee, and he is monitoring. And as you've seen in, in the previous slide, he's been out in the field checking the sterilization uh, program, checking the field hospital, and being on top of things really. And with his instruction, Dubai has achieved a lot. Doctor, I believe that's uh, in the lower image, uh, the gentleman with his hand on his chin is uh, His Highness Sheikh Mansour bin Mohammed. Am I right? Sahih, correct. Okay, and, and others, of course, uh, Her Excellency Mun Al Murri, Ahmed Gatami, and many others. Uh, okay. Very well. So uh, th thank you, Doctor. Uh, I think we'll start now. Uh, let me. We'll start now by uh, by uh, going through questions, uh, Doctor. I think uh, the the I think the first question I will uh, I will ask you is: Has the use of technology been uh, been has technology been overall a positive or a negative uh, um, Im has a negative impact on this current crisis? Alhamdulillah, I think we've seen positives from this current crisis. Uh, technology uh, can go negative sometimes. Uh, however, we've seen very, very positive examples. Uh, we've been honored uh, not only to create our own, but also learn from the best around us uh, in terms of technology that has been implemented or in the pipeline. Okay. Uh, Doctor, I will start taking questions from uh, from uh, from the chat. I think one thing, one question that uh, I think looms on the minds of uh, of many people uh, comes from uh, Kamil Al Asmar, uh, who asks: To what extent uh, are states uh, going to compromise the privacy of a user to make sure everyone is safe? So there is going to be some kind of compromise, as Kamil says, that between safety of everybody and between uh, giving up data. So how do we arrive at that balance? Do we look at the example of countries like China, countries like the West, or do we have other examples that we are considering now? Alhamdulillah, within the United Arab Emirates, we have studied all of these uh, scenarios since 2012. And we have a law out uh, in, in association with the federal government, the Ministry of Health and Prevention, which states what to be done in such instances 
and states what do you do in case there was a breach as well. So uh, alhamdulillah, uh, these laws are out. They, they are guiding us at this stage. We think in the best of the patient, of course, as a doctor, I'm thinking always in the best of the patient's masrah uh, uh, al ولكن at this time, when it's force majeure, of course, we also have to respect the privacy and confidentiality of the, the patient. Um, doctor, uh, we have a, a question from uh, uh, one of my students, one of my Yale students, Ahmed Sayyid, who says, and he lives in Singapore, and he, he uh, a college student, and he asks, migrant worker communities tend to be quite vulnerable in such dire situations. How are we handling outreach and monitoring of uh, migrant communities and, and, and labor camps, uh, for instance? Correct. Um, I think many of you come across labor camps uh, regularly in Dubai. Dubai is, is a developing city and construction has been an amazing pillar of our economy. Now, the, the functional unit of construction is the laborer. Uh, forget the engineers, forget the technology around them, forget the cranes. The, the, the functional unit tends to be the health of the laborer as well. So what we have seen right now is, uh, alhamdulillah, in, in cities like Dubai and, and, and the rest of the Emirates, where this has been regulated a lot. This has been uh, regulated in terms of providing sanitary wear, providing uh, sanitizers, providing social distancing awareness in all of their languages. So uh, my father is into the construction business and, and I, I've been happy to, uh, to see a lot of the uh, uh, awareness material done in the laborer's language. Um, now, some, uh, and the law has allowed these construction companies to tell them, to tell the owners of these construction companies, look, you are now in such a situation where you have to decide what is best for the laborer. Uh, uh, wages are respected, however, if needs to be, there is a law out there that specifies what to do with these wages in case the company is going into a, a crisis. Um, now, what we've also seen, and which is an amazing gesture from the community itself, uh, specifically working with the Islamic Affairs uh, Department and Government of Dubai. We've seen many initiatives launched, SMS donation initiatives, where you can donate for meals, going to uh, labor camps and helping and supporting laborers. And Alhamdulillah, yesterday I had an amazing uh, phone call with one of my friends who was a restaurateur. He owns a restaurant. And I told him, please let me know if you need anything. Please let me know if there is... Uh, a shortage of some sort. He said, Muhammad, money is coming to our accounts and we don't know from where all what we are getting is that it's coming from ICAD and we are, uh, with Alhamdulillah, he says, we've been amazedly, amazingly shocked that we can reduce the price of a meal to 5.5 dirhams. Uh, mm -hmm. dirham but you can imagine a thousand dirhams will go a long way. Doctor, I think a point that you just made is very important that we sometimes can think and we can get caught up in all the smart technologies and 3D printing and apps and all that. But sometimes you really have to go uh, into basics, low tech printed papers, especially if you want to appeal to uh, individuals who aren't so technology literate. I think I count myself. Uh, amongst that uh, category perhaps, but really people who have not been able to pursue ed education, you need to look at printed material uh, in, their, uh, in their own languages. Um, Doctor, we have a question from uh, uh, Bloomberg uh, journalist, uh, Dr. Ziad Dawood, uh, who asks, uh, when do we expect the number of cases to peak in the UAE? And maybe, I know that this is not your, uh, your, your specialty, but is there any kind of technology or smart solution to find out when the numbers would peak? Technologies are there, uh, Stad Ziad. Um, simulation is always there based on data. Now, the variables in such a situation are huge. We are facing variables every day, every hour. So in terms of saying it's scenario B as opposed to scenario B is very, very difficult. All what I can tell you is that as a physician, as a doctor, what's important to me is um, two KPIs, mortality and morbidity. God forbid we want to reduce the mortality KPI to the minimum. This is, a, this is the most important KPI for us. Forget the number of positives, forget the other numbers. Yes, we're increasing capacity, which is amazing. The other... Uh, uh, KPI, which is the morbidity. And in this instance, I would focus on the comorbidity. So if a patient is positive, what comorbidities, what other diseases do they have? This is another changing variable, which we don't know, and we cannot speculate. 
yes, you can use AI to say, uh, within the United Arab Emirates, you have 19% diabetes, hence your, your scenario is going to be A as opposed to B. However, the variables are huge. Uh, looking at the data on daily basis, looking at the variables, looking at decision makers' lives, it is not easy. Uh, Doctor, I have a teacher, Saleh Mohammadi, from the Ministry of Education in Oman, who asks, does the UAE have a maker spaces, have maker spaces to manufacture open source medical supplies like masks and ventilators? Yes, we, uh, we rely actually on the private sector a lot. The government has not invested. Uh, the government has regulated. Even if you, see, if you see our model in Dubai Health Authority, we do not own the 3D printing machines. Luckily, uh, Julian uh, and Synterex have uh, uh, provided these machines and we have a contract with them to operate and maintain these machines and to supply us with the devices that require. Now, with the private sector, we have, alhamdulillah, very strong uh, private sector. Uh, since the launch of the strategy of 3D printing strategy for the Emirate of Dubai by His Highness, Sheikh Hamad Barashat al-Maktoub, uh, uh, UAE Vice President, ruler of Dubai, and uh, uh, the, the strategy has flourished, amazingly has flourished. Uh, I remember in September 2016, this is when the strategy was launched, um, I was looking at, at the database of how many 3D printing companies do we have in Dubai, and there was zero. Today, alhamdulillah, we have more than 10 amazing 3D printing uh, facilities in Dubai. A lot of them are state of the art. They're using uh, amazing filaments, and I've visited many of them, and they are ready to make whatever you want. Victor, I think here I also want to thank you. Uh, I have been approached by a number of my friends who have manufacturing facilities, and I put them in touch with you, and I believe you have uh, worked with them. And I just want to say that uh, thank you so much for uh, being so proactive and, uh, and, and being engaging with, with people who are approaching you at this time. Uh, so this reflects, I think, your readiness and your welcoming. We have a gentleman called Uthman Furtasi, who is from Yale University Dalberg Advisors, who asked what platform is being used in the UAE to communicate all uh, government non-pharmaceutical initiatives. Um, I think just even communication to the public. What platforms are we using? Is it, are we relying on social media? Are we relying on WhatsApp? Are we relying on the news? I think this is something we, we want to know to minimize mixed messages. No, in terms of, uh, and I speak about the platforms that we are using in government of Dubai, Dubai Health Authority, uh, we're using uh, e-prescription platforms in association with claims, insurance claims, as you can imagine, um, insurance uh, usually pays for uh, pharmaceuticals. We're also using Epic as an electronic medical record within Dubai Health Authority facilities. Uh, and currently within uh, such, such pandemics, we're using uh, other, other systems as well from uh, Panorama, if you're familiar with them. So there is an interplay of systems. There's not one system. Okay. Doctor, um, you're one of the few people I know who still goes out to the real world. Uh, so how is it? How are things in the real world? Uh, I think you meet some officials. You might meet a minister. You might meet the head of Dubai Health Authority. Do you shake hands? Do you hug? Do you? How are things in the real world? Well, uh, for one thing, traffic is much less. Uh, it used to take me uh, about 45 minutes to get to my office. It takes me now about 15 minutes. So I'm very happy there. Uh, upon arrival, uh, there is a thermal camera taking. Uh, of uh, the temperature of my body, uh, and there is a very, very strict security guard. Prior to that, there is a disinfection uh, frame, which I walk through, and it, it's like taking a shower before going into the office. Um, and then once I arrive at His Excellency's office, uh, there, is, there is no shake hands. Uh, I'm usually wearing a face mask and gloves. Um, while sitting at, at meetings, uh, uh, government meetings, we usually sit one chair alternative uh, apart. So a chair yes, a chair no. Um, a lot of teleconferencing facilities, we, we don't have in one room more than five to six people at maximum. Uh, and usually our meetings are uh, luckily much faster using teleconferencing. Mm. Uh, Doctor, we have a question from Arnim Musselman who asks, is the UAE considering introducing a contact tracing app uh, for after the lockdown? It seems that Singapore and Taiwan have implemented uh, uh, so that they avoid a second so-called outbreak or peak? I think a lot of the investment that went into uh, specifically the OH example, which I showcased, is going to stay here for a while. Uh, the, the, the Department of Health, 
app. Uh, I showcased it earlier in the presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that Dubai is also working on a similar app. These apps are, are an investment. They, they cost us money to, to implement. And I can imagine that they will stay here. Now, um, all of this is part of regulations that government has imposed and a lot of, uh, a lot of collaboration with technology giants and so on. So I, I, I do not want to see them going away so quickly. Uh, a lot of data is going to be there not only to tell us, inshallah, we get out of this pandemic very, very fast, but a lot of data is going to be there to tell us how well have we done. Doctor, we have a Sharifa al Hinai from University of Oxford who asks, we've seen drones and robots being used in China to help out medical staff to perform tasks such as delivering medical samples, uh, maybe to reduce the risk of cross-infection. Are we considering in the UAE having similar technologies? Uh, any plans for the future? Yes, um, I've just finished a meeting with my team where we've looked at uh, almost 40 companies uh, looking at robotics and drones. Uh, the only limitation is that numbers, you need numbers right now. Uh, hence the example that I gave from Dubai municipality, we have our trucks ready and it only required putting these machines, modifying them a little bit for the national sterilization program. You can imagine robots are amazing and drones are amazing for a national sterilization program. However, you need them in numbers, you need them in bulk. Uh, right now, we're also working on uh, exploring the uh, disinfection using, using a robot. And these are examples that are available around the world using ultraviolet rays, um, uh, ultraviolet light as well. Uh, results are amazing. Uh, studies have shown that 99.9% .9 of disinfection can be done to a room using ultraviolet uh, light on a robot. Uh, Doctor, uh, there's Bassam Al Bassam who's asking, what is the current breakdown for each emirate in terms of cases, and why the discrepancy between each emirate in handling COVID, such as store opening, lockdowns, and such? I think I would also say that the UAE is a federal system, uh, unlike some other countries in the region. But uh, is it how important is it? I think to unify the regulations and laws uh, and such. So we're always guided by NCMA, the National uh, Committee for Disaster. Uh, they set the lines, we give them our data, and they, uh, they, uh, they receive data from multiple other areas, and they decide the coordination. I assure you that all of this is happening in, coordinated, uh, in a coordinated manner. Um, however, the more coordination, the, 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 the more collaboration in such instance is, is, a, is a very positive thing. And another thing I, I would stress on is the speed of implementation. Uh, Doctor, I believe we have uh, one of your colleagues. Uh, is it uh, um, uh, Mr. Deepak Kaura? Uh, can you hear me, Mr. Deepak? Okay, I'm have to unmute you. Uh, Doctor, may I ask Mr. Deepak to uh, say a few words? I believe that you work uh, together with him. Absolutely. May I? Okay, uh, uh, Mr. Deepak, please go ahead. Uh, hi, thank you so much. Um, uh, it, it's actually totally inspirational to see what you're doing. I'm calling in from Vancouver in, uh, in Canada. And, um, you know, one of the things that I, I heard being asked was, what is the role of technology in this pandemic? And I think it's important to recognize that there are enormous leaps and bounds being made in the world of machine learning. In, and you can see different publications coming out every day. In the world of computer-aided drug design, I think we're going to see some, you know, traditionally back in, 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 in the old school, and you still see video clips right now of people pipetting things into things, it, you know, a lot of that has moved on now to be able to be done um, virtually. And so the reason why we've been able to move so incredibly fast to looking at vaccines and looking at new treatment uh, is that we can take these molecules that have been uh, identified in three dimensions and actually uh, run them against uh, models that look at how they bind to other molecules and then see if there's any cross um, activity from currently existing medications that might be able to work on this uh, on this virus. So these are sort of things that we could never do in the past. And I think the use of technology is definitely, I mean, first of all, it's totally inspirational what you guys are doing in, in Dubai. I'm blown away. And I really hope that you are doing this in a, in a way that you can publish this in the academic literature because um, you have the unique capability to be able to do these things that very few of us in the rest of the world have. But, uh, but, but I just wanted to opine that, you know, pe people should understand that this, this, has res this entire pandemic has resulted in a very significant change in the way we approach um, development of new drugs and vaccines, and partly because of this 
uh, there's there's been a recent uh, piece of activity just so everybody knows where um, someone's tried to look at one of the biggest issues is how does this molecule um, that is part of the virus actually fold and there's a protein folding problem and so uh, one company has actually decided that they would um, help by harnessing the, the computers around the world uh, together uh, during their spare time because there's such little economic activity happening and uh, and has been able to to do that work um, at faster and, uh, and and with more capacity than the largest supercomputers and of course as we look at the future and you know I work in a quantum computing company right now and as we look at the future for for um, for this I think in the next five to ten years we're going to see quantum computers come online and dramatically change the way we approach these sorts of things um, I just thought it would be really important for everyone to understand that this, um, this time is different and, and it is because of technology. Uh, Dr. May, I just ask you one quick question. You talked about uh, harnessing the power of our mobile phone. So the idea is that when we're asleep, we're fo our phones are on the table next to us and that rather than keeping them uh, on the table doing nothing, uh, maybe uh, we can have them actually do some good and run some processes and, uh, and some uh, formulas. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's, that's certainly the model, and it's being used very effectively right now for protein folding, but it's not necessarily using your mobile. Um, at present, there's only a few mobile devices that have really powerful enough chips to be able to do that type of work. But, um, but, as, uh, but, but there's definitely computers that are available in universities around the world and computers that are available in people's homes that are powerful enough to be able to contribute to a global um, effort. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor. Uh, thank you. No problem. My pleasure. Uh, Dr. Dr. Mohamed Rada, I have just so many questions, so let me just go over. Uh, what do you, so there's a gentleman called uh, Sayyid who asked, when do you think it's the proper time to ease the lockdown uh, in terms of secondary prevention? Uh, this might be maybe out of, uh, out of uh, sort of your territory, but is there, a, once again, a way that we can tell through technology? Do you need data? Do you have enough data to do this? Absolutely, uh, alhamdulillah, we have, we have enough data. But the problem this time is not only with the data and the quality of the data, which has been consuming a lot of our energy in the past. It's about the variables with the data. What changes at what time and with which patient and uh, even the tests. Uh, allow me to explain the, the modalities that we use here. Uh, we use two modalities and, and this is, uh, I think a lot of you will read many, many articles, uh, be it from newspapers or from uh, literature reviews and so on. We are currently using two. PCR and antibody testing. PCR is where you take uh, the nasal swab and insert it into the analyzer. You test for the gene of the virus and then it comes back to you whether it's positive or not. Antibody is sort of an indirect way of testing for the, the, the virus presence. It is testing your immune system response to the virus. So it's an indirect way. Now, PCR is, is the 100% available test, 100% sensitive available test out there. And this is our 100%. This is the, the commoner man's 100%. However, there are false negatives and there are false positives. The same thing with antibody. Antibody is not even close to 100%. It is much, much less. So if we rely on PCR testing and we rely on the mathematical formula of what is allowed as, as, as a false positive and a false negative, there you go as well. You have variables, even with tests that you believe are 100% positive. Now, other nations have struggled in terms of availability of tests. We don't have that. Other nations have struggled with, uh, with uh, the availability of PCR capability of testing. Alhamdulillah, we don't have that as well. Other nations have gone into antibody testing immediately. Alhamdulillah, we have not gone there yet. So, so we, are, we are still going with the best that's available out there. So given all of that and given the, the condition of the patient and given the comorbidity of the patient, it's been a moving target in terms of when can you ease uh, the lockdown and even where are we on the graph right now? A lot of these nations uh, that I've displayed their data, this is data in retrospect. This wasn't real-time data. As you can imagine, the virus moved uh, from east to west to, to Italy and then almost came back to us. So it, it flew over us and then came back to us. So um, we are in delay in terms of uh, 
uh, getting the the, uh, the COVID-19 and with all the efforts and with all the learning opportunities that we've had, luckily, we have both time. And this time has made it post, uh, possible for us to flatten the curve, reduce the curve, and hopefully uh, have increased the capacity of our medical supplies, our medical facilities in the right direction. Doctor, I have so many questions because I only have 10 minutes to go. So if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you to keep your answers to under 30 seconds so I can shoot yeah. as many uh, questions to you. The first question is from uh, 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 UC Fazili, who says that in the uh, US, the false negative rate is around 30%. What is the rate of false negative tests in the UAE? I don't have it right now on me. However, if you're talking about antibodies, it, it is quite high. Okay. Uh, Doctor, uh, you, in preparing for this talk, you said something that I really like. You said that the house is the most important unit in the society and in the country. Can you elaborate on what you mean about that? Uh, I think this is geared specifically towards parents. Uh, and what do you advise them and what technologies uh, do you advise them to use? So if there are any nephrologists around us, they, they will understand that the nephron is the, the functional unit of a kidney. And if there are any neurologists around us, they will understand that the neuron is the functional unit of a, of a neurological system. So the family right now, the house, is the functional unit of a society. So wherever you have a healthy family, a healthy house, alhamdulillah, negative uh, COVID testing, uh, this is what we need right now. Keep your family's health uh, in 100% in, uh, in shape. Uh, keep them uh, away from from everything else. Uh, you, alhamdulillah, the, uh, I mean, I can give another talk in terms of the technology available in a house as opposed to available outside the house in terms of national sterilization and apps. Today, alhamdulillah, we, in Dubai, we, we have online grocery shopping. Uh, we have, uh, alhamdulillah, tele, I call it telemedicine, but it's distant education for my children. So, so two of my children are, are, are in their rooms with their computers and online with their, with their uh, teachers and their school. They are, they are, they are exercising. They are, uh, they are learning a lot. I don't want to say more than what they would have been learning in school, but they are, they are learning a lot, alhamdulillah. And the, their, their health, their mental health, as I'm noticing it, is, is, in, is in good shape. So this, this is what's important to me right now. And this is what, you, this is what should be important to you. And, and this functional unit makes a community. If we take care of our families well, we will be taking care of the community well. Um, so there's so many questions. Uh, Imad Atwi, uh, who is, works a strategy and uh, a consultancy firm, asks about big data for tracking and responding drones for spraying, surveying, uh, and telemedicine, treating patients in remote areas. Is there a focus to invest on these technologies in the UAE? What is the current status and challenges? Does it include privacy? Absolutely. I think uh, I'll answer the privacy bit first. Yes, we have a use of ICT in healthcare law. It's a federal, federal law. It's been out since 2019. Um, and I think we, we will see a lot of investment, private investment in, uh, in companies that are uh, looking into data analysis, artificial intelligence, cloud computing. Big data is an old term. I don't use it anymore. I think it's, it's just data available on a cloud with high power computing as uh, Deepak there mentioned, uh, quantum computing hopefully that can compute anything you want in, in literally seconds. Dr. Ali Kavam asks, uh, are there any, is there any agenda to share technology, data, uh, uh, software and hardware with neighboring countries who are struggling with COVID? I think um, proven that it works. I think the United Arab Emirates as a government has been very, very kind. Uh, if you can imagine these flights that have been commissioned to take uh, certain nationalities back to their countries based on their will and their desire, in the belly of that, that flight, there is, uh, alhamdulillah, uh, there is about a uh, carriage of uh, 10 ton of support, medical supplies, going back to these countries, countries in need, of course. So I think it's, it's only a matter of time where we will see that we are exporting knowledge and technology to countries who need that. Uh, we, we're living, we're lucky to be living under the leadership of UAE government where sharing is, is a common thing. Uh, Ahmed Zarouni, a master's student asked, do you think COVID-19 will affect our behaviors in general in the future after uh, after this crisis is over in regards to how we socialize, study and work. Again, this is not really in your, in your uh, uh, domain, but if you care to comment about it. I think there will be a new normal. So if you look up uh, uh, the new normal in Google, you, you will find a lot of uh, cues to that. 
Doctor, uh, there's a question from, uh, okay, Adam Barron actually just asked uh, about the new normal. Is there any sense of when this uh, measures will dissip uh, dissipate? Uh, do you think uh, that we are looking at uh, screening uh, measures and airports? Is this going to be normal? That not just in Dubai, but international airports, how are we going to make sure that this doesn't disrupt uh, the travel uh, industry? No. My grandfather used to go to the airport three hours in advance of the flight. Okay, I go an hour and a half before the flight. So his, his idea of going three hours in advance uh, is that what if you get a flat, uh, flat tire on the way? So you have time. However, I think the new normal will be up to, and I hear this, I, I'm, I'm only speculating, it can go up to nine hours in advance of your flight to go and get through the screening process. Uh, Wow. Okay, uh, Doctor, uh, we have a, uh, a request for, uh, from uh, Alisar uh, Nasr, who says, uh, what's your message here? Uh, is your message uh, one, are we, are we meant to be hopeful? Are we meant to be more um, apprehensive? Uh, how do we proceed from here on? We have to be hopeful and look at nations such as uh, Japan, for example. Japan is one of also the countries who, who literally did not do a lot. Okay, uh, and, and I always uh, have this image of, of, a, of a Japanese uh, society where they're, they're wearing masks regularly, they don't shake hands, uh, highly uh, sanitized uh, cities and houses. I think this is going to be part of our new normal as well. Okay. So we have to be hopeful. We have to be hopeful, but we have to also uh, change a lot of things. I think uh, Ali Hashmi is, uh, is inspired by uh, wearables. He goes, uh, next generation wearables will also likely be part of the large scale screening, scanning, prevention solution. Do you expect us uh, in the UAE or around the world to be working with gadgets, to be working with some kind of smart devices on us other than our mobile phones uh, in the future? Is this something that's going to be normal? Um, What's your opinion here? I mean, I mean, we've seen the smart or the intelligent helmet for Dubai police and uh, uh, I think there are, there are many more gadgets that will be designed specifically for industry. Uh, one of them is the judicial system. I think they will have different gadgets to be online uh, courts, uh, online, immediate, fast courts, um, where you don't need to be present at a court, for example. So these gadgets are going to be picking up. I, I'm not sure about wearables specifically, but definitely specific gadgets towards a task. Uh, Ami, Ma Ami Marom, Marom says uh, about your comment of nine hours, wait, he says there's more time to spend in the lounge uh, <laughs> when you go to the well, airport. Sure it all will be spent in the lounge. I mean, you will be going from one screening gate to the other. Doctor, uh, you, you, you said to me, we are all, this is my last comment, you said to me, we are all as good as our weakest link. How can we strengthen our weakest link? Who is our weakest link? Is it a country? Is it an individual? Is it, are we all in this together as a world? What is the weakest link here? Our weakest link would be our weakest healthcare system, wherever that may be. Uh, we are only as good as that weakest healthcare system, not only in this pandemic, but in, in, in future pandemics, uh, we are only going to be as good as our weakest healthcare link. Um, Dr. Mohamed Darrava, Director, Projects Management Office, uh, Dubai Health Authority. Uh, thank you so much for sparing this time for us. Uh, I've had so many comments and questions uh, that I would be sending you. Once again, this is going to be uh, recorded so uh, you guys can send it to each other, to other people. Thank you once again for joining us tonight. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Julian. Uh, thank you, Deepak, and all of you for joining us. I'll see you guys uh, next Wednesday. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak. Thank you, Julian. Thank you to all the audience.